Worldwide, cardiovascular disease affects the lives of hundreds of millions. Dedicated cardio nerds everywhere are working hard to fight this global epidemic. These are their stories. Hey, Cardio Nerds, welcome back to the Pennsylvania ACC and Cardio Nerds Narratives and Cardiology series designed to promote diversity and inclusion in cardiology because our differences make us stronger. As you know, for this series, we invite inspiring experts to tell us all about their professional areas of passion and their personal journeys. And today we get to fly to New York, New York to get some inspiration from a leader in our field, Dr. Anulala. But hey, Dan, as Air Force Cardio Nerds hits the runway, What's the weather like in LaGuardia Airport? Mm -mm. It is great to be back in New York City. I was actually there just a couple of weeks ago for realsies. And uh, we are so glad that we were able to steer away, steer clear from any Canadian geese and land in LaGuardia, not in the Hudson. I'm not sure if that joke is going to work, but I just said it will uh, take it out if we need to. But um, anyways, we cannot have a, mute, have a more beautiful, crisp fall evening for our discussion tonight. It's 65 degrees and beautiful, not a cloud in the sky, a beautiful moon. Today, we have two very special guests, Letitia and Celia. Can you both introduce yourselves? Letitia, why don't you go first? Hey, everyone. I'm so excited to be here tonight. Then you just mentioned that it's a 65 degree crisp fall evening at LaGuardia Airport. And I have to say that as a Brazilian, I would probably describe this as a freezing night in New York City. But my name is Leticia Helms. I'm, a cur I'm currently enjoying my, my internal life. I'm an internal medicine resident at Columbia. I'm also really, I also really, I also really enjoy doing research and I'm part of the critical care research group in the International ECMO Network. I was very flattered by this invitation. This is such an important topic, and I'm even more flattered to be sharing this episode with these amazing, powerful, and inspirational women. So thanks for the invite, Dan and Emmett, and thank you for giving us a space to talk about this. So my name is Celia DeFilippis, and I'm an advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology fellow at Columbia University Irving Medical Center um, in New York City, and happy to be back here with Cardio Nerds. And today we are lucky to be joined by Dr. Anu Lala, an advanced heart function, not failure and transplant specialist at Mount Sinai Hospital in New York City and the fellowship director. She is also the director of heart failure research for the NHLBI Cardiothoracic Surgery Network and deputy editor of the Journal of Cardiac Failure. She is also involved in multiple professional organizations and she is a true cardio nerds having served as an expert for the cardio nerds Cardiac Critical Care Series. Dr. Lala, welcome back to Cardio Nerds. Gosh, what an honor it is to be here with all of you tonight. Thank you so much for having me. I don't know if I'm necessarily considered a leader in our field at all, because I still feel like very much a follower. Um, and I'm just really adding to the long list of people who admire you all and are so proud of what you guys have created here at Cardio Nerds and are building upon um, and really expanding upon Okay, so this is perfect. So <laughs> it's good night time for the monkeys. Mwah. Hey guys. Hey monkeys. Hi. Hey monkeys. Hi. <laughs> Welcome. <laughs> I thought I heard footsteps. I was like, because I was going to jump in and be like, uh, Dr. Lola, I hear something that's oh happening here. <laughs> Literally like amazing. sweating. <laughs> <laughs> so, so for the audience, uh, what just happened? <laughs> Okay, so in true form, that was actually much tamer than it could have been. So thank God. Um, oh. My kids, uh, Ambika and Ajay, who are eight and five, just came in to say goodnight. Um, but what I was really doing is just paying homage to you guys and, and congratulating you all on this incredible forum that is not just applicable to trainees um, across the United States, but really globally and to clinicians. And so um, I think you've done just such a beautiful job and you've added a light to all of our lives through this platform. So thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. Well, thank you so much for the very kind and generous, generous words, Sakralala. And I'm so glad that your two little monkeys stopped by to say hi, because, you know, one thing we like to show on Cardi Nerds is that um, we, we all um, have multiple roles. And, and those roles don't always have to be completely distinct and separate from one another. And those roles, uh, you know, our, our, our ability um, in one role maybe makes us better at another. And so all the time, you know, we have like dance kids that crash the recording, my kids, people's dogs, cats, all sorts of things. So it's, it's always so nice to see 
people outside of their professional lives and a little bit of glimpse of their personal lives. And we've even had a motorcycle gang uh, crash once. (laughs) Yeah, that was a different story. (laughs) We're human first, right? (laughs) But Dr. Lala, if you consider yourself as a follower, you've got a long line of cardi nerds uh, following you. And so it's just such an honor and pleasure to learn from you again on cardi nerds. Let's start off with a two-part question. What drew you to cardiology and to heart function or failure specifically? And and how has your research career evolved alongside your clinical one? And I remember the first time I got to hear your voice in person was at Dr. Valentin Fuster's ACC, How to Become a Cardiovascular Investigators course in DC. And fun fact, it was actually that trip when I was visiting from uh, Cleveland that I uh, ended up spending a couple of extra nights in uh, Baltimore, which is obviously right next door to DC. And that's uh, that weekend was when Dan and I recorded our very first Cardi Nerds episode. Wow, I didn't know that. That's amazing. Um, <laughs> I, I love that course. I'm so glad that Dr. Fuster sort of developed that. I'm going to try and sound unique uh, and not put forth a stereotypical sort of South Asian story of a young Indian girl who was born knowing she wanted to be a doctor. But in reality, I had an experience as a child. My grandmother was visiting from India when I was about 12 or so, and she actually had an inferior MI in our living room. And she refused, you know, she was elderly. She refused to go to the hospital. And my father is a cardiologist. He brought his EKG machine home, um, brought some morphine home, some high dose aspirin, and I think a statin. Um, and we watched her all night. I'll, I'll never forget it for as long as I live, you know, have sort of emesis and the pain and everything that happened was so classic. And I remember I was charged with, you know, sort of keeping track of her pulse for the, for the night. And it was such an unbelievable experience, as you might imagine, that it's become a fabric of a part of the fabric of who I am so much so that even now someone actually pointed it out without my realizing it, that I make sure I feel the pulse of every patient that I get to interact with, because there's something so powerful with that touch. But then I think subconsciously, it also sort of brings me back to the roots of of where it all started and where the interest uh, originated. Along the way, I did terribly in organic chemistry and did not want to do medicine and wanted to rebel against all things Indian parent and then was a creative writing major that then went into neuroscience and anthropology and then sort of ended up loving um, the biomedical sciences in at Hopkins where I was for undergrad. Um, and then, you know, and then I got into medical school, blah, 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 all, all sort of typical, but that's where it all started. Um, how my research career evolved? Well, uh, it's certainly not a conventional one. Um, and, and maybe one that purists may not want advertised, but I'm sort of proud of its non-traditional evolution. I always loved being by the bedside. I, always, I continue to love being at the bedside and in clinic interacting with patients um, and their families. Uh, And I always loved cardiology. And I'd say along the way, um, I'm probably not unique in saying that I thought of research as a necessary pursuit for me to be able to reach my destination, right? And along the way, what was interesting is I always enjoyed what I did. Um, It didn't really end up feeling like a means to an end, even though that might have been how it all started. I really, really enjoyed working alongside mentors. I love the idea of asking a question and then trying to answer it with a cohort that you had something to do with or that you had something, you you got to do some of the original um, looking up of where those patients came from. Um, And so I, I sort of continued to love the projects that I was involved in, however small they may have been. And then when I was a fellow at NYU, I'd say among many, many others, but you know, one person that really, really impacted me was Judy Hoffman. She was just so incredibly passionate about research and its necessity in what we do. And it really, it was contagious, honestly. It had, um, and so I, I, I sort of caught the bug, if you will, and I felt really supported and sponsored by um young investigator awards through the AHA and ACC and others. And then you sort of feel really 
um, you, you kind of ride this wave of encouragement, I think. And there's so many opportunities for fellows in training that I, I really sort of enjoyed that a lot. And I was like, okay, well, this research thing is actually pretty, pretty great. It wasn't until I got to um, Brigham and Women's where I did my advanced heart failure training that I felt like Lynn Stevenson and Mandeep Mara, amongst many, many others there, all of whom I adore, really helped me appreciate that research equaled curiosity. And having curiosity is just amazing. It keeps everything alive and fresh. And I felt like being there was like in medical Disneyland for research relative to what I was used to in New York, where everything was like sort of doing things with your teeth, you know? Um, and so uh, it, it, it may have hit me later on in my training and career, but it's become a big part of what I do and what I love today in the capacity of, you know, overseeing clinical trials and participating in clinical trials, trying to answer my own questions. And then working with others to arrive at answers and then ultimately more questions. But that's it in a nutshell. Wow. I mean, I think that, um, thank you so much for sharing that. It definitely resonates with me on a few levels. One is also being someone who kind of always knew that I wanted to do medicine. My father is um, a physician as well. And thinking about, you know, how great it is to think of a question when you're on rounds and wonder, I wonder if there's any data on that and then be a part of that, um, you know, curiosity, as you mentioned, and that kind of exploration of ideas. Um, and also reminds me of my days at uh, Brigham and Women's as a medicine resident rounding with uh, Dr. Stevenson on the heart failure service. Um, so thank you so much for sharing that. I think one of the unique characteristics about the field of advanced heart failure is that women have really played integral roles in the founding recognition and development of the field. Um, you know, for example, Sharon Hunt is often considered the matriarch of heart transplantation and her work really set the stage for the birth of advanced heart failure and transplant cardiology as a subspecialty. And in an interview, Dr. Hunt postulated that women may be more highly represented in heart failure as a result of the enduring presence of women role models and mentors, as well as the inclusion of women since the field's inception. And she also hypothesized that women have been successful because of the aptitude of collaborative work, which is really at the essence of taking care of our patients with advanced heart failure. And so I was wondering how this resonates with your own experience, both as a mentor and as a mentee. Gosh, I mean, this resonates so strongly with me. In fact, I'd probably wager that most anything Sharon Hunt says will. Um, but, you know, along those lines, heart failure is unique in that it truly requires that cross-disciplinary collaboration at the precipice of what is often life and death, right? So it's just such an unbelievably unique space. Um, it requires tremendous empathy emotional intelligence, um, integration of knowledge and feeling, um, and really kind of holistic care, you know? Um, and and I, I don't wanna stereotype by any means, but that oftentimes those words that I just mentioned are oftentimes um, words you hear uh, women love engaging in, if you will, or find ex exhilarating. And by that, by, by no means is that unique to women. But as far as what Dr. Hunt said, I think watching women pioneer the field from Sharon Hunt to Lynn Stevenson to Donna Mancini and so many other countless pioneers. I mean, Maggie Redfield, um, Joanne Lindenfeld, Muriel Jessup, Beacon Boscourt. I mean, the list goes on and on and on. And it's, it's just beyond inspiring. It's also very inviting to women, right? Because it points to the importance of seeing people do things before you who look like you, right? It's that whole hashtag, like I look like a cardiologist, like I could be like that. I could see myself like that person. And when you have these giants in front of you um, that you feel like you can aspire to be like, I think it, it is not only inspiring, as I said, but it's inviting. And I think that's, uh, 
in large part why so many women do pursue heart failure. It's, it's certainly part of the reason why it, you know, I was uh, drawn toward the field. Yes, and having uh, people like you opening doors and then making us dream about like pursuing this field and then engaging in research of this type is like really inspiring for us that are coming uh, right next. So I think uh, come, getting into this field and getting into the representation and then women in the, the clinical trials, but also like doing research, we know that in the upper echelons of professional society leadership and clinical trial leadership, women are still vastly underrepresented. You recently co-authored a review topic in JACC regarding the lack of women in high-profile cardiovascular clinical trials. We know that women only represent one in 10 authors of cardiovascular trials in high-impact journals. We also know that when we improve diversity in clinical trial leadership, we can improve the diversity of trial participants, which makes our research stronger and more generalizable. In fact, at eight, eight AHA21, our Cardio Nerds Academy members, Drs. Gerlin Kaur, Jesse Holtman, and Julie Power presented some data from the LBCT from ACC21 with mentorship from Dr. Martha Gulati. Out of 25 LBCT presented at HCC21, zero had a female first author, only two had a female senior author, and zero were presented by women. What obstacles have you faced in your journey as a clinical trialist and what strategies can help us overcome these inequities in professional opportunity and career advancement? Sorry, I was trying to get off mute. Forgive me. Thanks, Leticia. I think really, really great points and, and thanks for that question. I have sort of a slightly uh, different take on things. I think I'm like this eternal optimist, maybe even to a fault, uh, really in that I refuse to become cynical or down about, you know, this lack of representation and lack of women in leadership and, and in prominent authorship roles. Um, but rather I want observations like these critically important pieces, you know, the, the paper in Jack was really largely led by Harriet Mansbell and, and, and Beacon Boscourt after CBCT last year, along with luminaries, really, it was just such an all-star um, authorship list. But what I loved about it is that it focused on action items. It, it wasn't, forgive me for speaking sort of like maybe casually, but it wasn't a pity party, right? Like boo-hoo, women are not represented. Yes, that is the case. And so here's the problem. Let me tell you why it's important for us to change it, because we know that diversity is associated with more, diversity in clinical trial leadership is associated with more diverse trial participants, which then improves the generalizability of the results and the analysis, right? And okay, so I've told you the problem, I've told you why it's important to solve it, and then here are the proposals to solve it, right? So we need to have deliberate action. We need to monitor key metrics by individual investigators, academic institutions, professional societies, industry sponsors, funding agencies, scientific journals, et cetera, all of those different platforms need to be equally engaged to overcome uh, gender inequality in cardiovascular clinical trial leadership. Similarly, you know, you, the, the wonderful effort led by the cardio nerds and Dr. Gulati really pointed out kind of lack of prominent um, authorship roles for women. And I, again, I think it's so incredibly important for us to move to action. Right. And so at least I've been so, so proud to work with Rob Mentz and, and our whole editorial board to try and, you know, put forth a little bit of that action at JCF. Right. In that we are very, very deliberate about invitations for any kind of editorial reviewership, authorship, any participation, really, there has to be equal uh, representation, not only across gender, but race, ethnicity, like we really want it to be more about belonging than it is about DEI, which has become kind of a little bit of an overused buzzword, if you ask me. 
it's like, oh yeah, this is our DEI initiative because it's like hip and we need to do it. But like, what does it really mean at the end? It's like, we all, all human beings want to feel heard. They want to feel seen and they want to feel like their voice matters and that they're participating. And so how do you do that? Well, you do that when you involve diverse people across every step of the way, whether it's patients in trials, whether it's leadership of the trials, whether it's authorship, whether it's something like this, like, look at us right now. Like, this is so cool, right? We, we kind of look like maybe like a Benetton commercial in the nineties, you know, and that's what it's about. Um, I think otherwise there's no point of similar people just talking to each other. There's less learning that goes on. So I feel like um, such data is so important and sometimes trivialized as not real research. And that drives me nuts because I think this is what points out the actual problem. You know, it's substantiating, this is the problem and look, I'm showing you how it's the problem. And that's what, inst- you know, catalyzes meaningful change. That is so helpful, Dr. Lala. And, you know, one of the inspirations for this whole narratives in cardiology series was, you know, really stemmed from a conversation that Amit and I have with Dr. Pam Douglas, who is really a big proponent of diversity and inclusion. And the way she kind of explained it to us is it's not just having representation in the field, but it's about making everybody feel really welcome on the dance floor. I mean, she didn't say this, but you know, that everybody should just be there and get down and boogie without feeling embarrassed, you know, and that is something that we really, really took to heart. And and that's kind of why we went with this. And um, it's not representation for the sake of reputation. Sorry, it's not representation for the sake of representation, but it's to actually make everybody feel belong and give a home to people within the field of cardiology. And, um, you know, it's also so refreshing to hear your approach to how you, you know, plan to overcome gender inequality and cardiovascular research leadership with deliberate action and key metrics, as you just talked about. And then speaking of Dr. Mance, who's one of our most wonderful mentors uh, as well, and the Journal of Cardiac Failure, in your tenure as deputy editor at Journal of Cardiac Failure, the journal has piloted a number of new initiatives. And one of them is blinded peer review. So that seems absolutely genius. And why was this important for you and the journal? And how do you think that this is going to impact women scientists specifically when they submit research and great work to your journal? Yeah, thanks, Dan, so much. Um, Yeah, Rob is a sort of one of the kind guy. And we have just an incredible editorial board who is diverse and forward thinking. And we use this term a lot at the journal where we say we're consciously, constructively disruptive. <laughs> that may be a little bit of a, a mouthful, especially at 8.30 at night, but it's like, okay, this is how we've been doing it for years. Why should we continue doing it the same way? right? Like when are we going to question what the status quo is to institute change, right? And so I think this was equally important to, to, it's not that this is just important to women or this is important to people of underrepresented minorities. It's just important in general because, you know, numerous publications have pointed to the fact that there are harsher reviews of underrepresented minorities and women. We all know that bias comes from seeing who published something or where it came from, you know, like this published, this was published in Hopkins or this came from the Hopkins group versus this came from a small community hospital in middle America. And all of a sudden you have a very different view of how you should be um, sort of assessing that manuscript and that research. And that's, it's not anyone's fault. It's just, we're human and we all have unconscious bias. We all do, I do. And so um, I think when things are blinded, it's just so much better for everybody, quite frankly, because the research and the writing are allowed to speak for themselves. You know, it's, it's just kind of a beautiful thing. In fact, I've had submissions rejected at JCF recently. And to be honest with you, it actually feels kind of good because it, it makes me feel proud of what we're doing. I mean, that sounds strange. And anyone I've worked with that has gotten rejected with me, I'm sorry for saying that. <laughs> but it, it just feels like we, we're going through this kind of unbiased, really objective look at things, you know, and, and it lends more credit to the peer review process, which has been kind of called into question and really, really at the forefront of what we've been talking about in scientific publishing, especially amidst the COVID pandemic. So, 
I think it's it's a very exciting um, time. I think we're going to see more and more of this um, in academic publishing, hopefully. And I think the key is, the key, key, key is, which we're desperately working on, is gathering data from this approach. Does this approach indeed lead to more diversity of authorship? Does it lead to more author satisfaction, reviewer satisfaction? Does it lead to better papers? We don't fully know. We assume it will, we hypothesize it will, um, but you know, the systematic collection of such data is not as easy as it sounds, but it's something we're really very committed to and, and hope to carry forward to be able to come back to our community and say, hey, this is the result of this initiative. This is what we think is happening as a result and let's keep going or let's tweak things to make it even better. Consciously, deliberately, disruptive. I love that. <laughs> this sounds it's really tricky, but sounds really good. And I think like this taking this bias out of the picture was a really amazing uh, thought for sure. And you touched on the COVID pandemic, and I think the COVID-19 pandemic has been challenging for many reasons. However, for the purposes of our conversation here tonight. I wanted to focus on the disproportionate impact of the pandemic on women in academic medicine. Given that women are more likely to he given that women are more likely to bear the burden of childcare in the setting of pandemic mandates for social and physical distancing and school closures, data has already shown the decreased academic productivity of women during this period. This has downstream consequences, including lack of grant funding, manuscript production, etc. And as a scientist, a mother, and a mentor to so many others, what impact do you think this will have? And how can we avoid such vulnerabilities in the future? Yeah, Leticia, thanks so much. You, you've hit on such a sensitive and relevant topic. Um, Again, maybe I sound like a, too much of an optimist, but there are some things that the COVID pandemic have offered that are actually helpful in some ways. And I just wanna spend a minute talking about the silver lining, if you will. Um, one, we're able to do something like this at eight o'clock at night, you know, on a Tuesday, is it Tuesday? I think it's Tuesday. Um, and. I, we don't have to be in person. We're able to do this virtually. We're able to connect a little bit more um, easily now. Um, some of those barriers have been broken. We're able to kind of connect across, um, you know, institutional boundaries, geographic boundaries. And I think that is in a way really wonderful. It allows for um, greater flexibility in schedules allows for more physical presence, at least with my kids. Well, physical presence, meaning we're in the same house right now, but eventually I'll be, you know, in the same room with them after this. But that that for me has been actually really, really helpful, to be honest. On the other hand, no doubt, um, we're more dependent on childcare and it's less available, right? Um, schools being shut down was probably one of the most taxing experiences of my life. <laughs> I, I think I still have nightmares about it. Um, and, and so there's certainly a lot um, that changed over this time period, but I think it's also shown us how resilient we are um, as women in, you know, in this field um, and, and that we will prevail. I think, um, we are learning to navigate this new normal, right? And we're learning what is also, I think, really beautiful. We were on a call this morning, our transplant and LVAD evaluation meeting is at seven in the morning here at Sinai. And, you know, one of my female colleagues was presenting a case um, for us to discuss and her little baby toddler and newborn were, you know, kind of crying in the background and we all were okay with it. I remember two or three years ago when it would be like, <gasps> I can't imagine anyone hearing my crying children on the phone, how terrible, you know? And now it's like, well, yeah, that's normal. You have to, that had, that's what it is, you know? Um, and so I think there's a little bit more understanding as to the fact that we are all human at the end of the day. And as Amit alluded to earlier, as you saw my kids come in at the beginning of this call, 
we're human first and we all have lives that extend beyond our academic roles. And so I think, um, you know, COVID has allowed us to understand that now. I think the key is for us to bring, to shine a light on the fact that there are also many, many challenges that come with that, that have resulted in less funding, less academic productivity, et cetera. And it hopefully will be the impetus for us to then be more deliberate, as I mentioned previously, about offering opportunities um, such that, okay, there is an opportunity for writing this paper. I need a woman and a man, and I need someone who's an underrepresented minority to be a part of this. I mean, just being very deliberate about how we go about involving people in different opportunities is really, really key. I mean, platforms such as this, are incredible about raising awareness and hopefully inspiring one another to be conscientious about how the pandemic may have affected all of us in different ways. And it's not just women really quick. I mean, there are plenty of dads out there, <clears throat> Dan, Amit, others who might've been joining us on this call who have been impacted as well. I think increasingly we're seeing more partnership um, in childcare and uh, I think we're, we're all in it together. So I see some really, strong and new silver linings here. And I think, again, I'm an optimist that I think that with deliberate um, attention being brought to this space, um, we're gonna see continued productivity. Thank you so much. I love the optimism and definitely something for us to carry forward with us into uh, 2022, which is rapidly approaching. Um, so Dr. Lala, you touched on this a little bit, and I think the partnership is a great segue. You're obviously a loving mom to two beautiful young children and also wife of an advanced endoscopist. Um, I'm actually engaged myself to um, a GI fellow who will be training in advanced endoscopy next year. So can you speak a little bit about what it's like to be part of a two physician couple, especially when one of you is joining Cardio Nerds at 8 p.m. on a school night? and how you and your husband have kind of negotiated responsibilities, both professional and personal. Yeah, thanks, Celia. First of all, congratulations on your upcoming wedding. We're all very, very excited for you. I will also argue that the heart failure advanced endoscopy <laughs> duo is a, is a good one. So <laughs> don't have any cold feet. It's, it's really a, a joy to be a part of. Um, but yeah, listen, it's a balancing act, right? And I, I think you guys might've heard about how Rob and I and others have, have kind of wanted to, and Andrew Sauer speaks about this as well, about moving away from this idea of how do you achieve work-life balance? You know, that's such a kind of like, we all ask the same question and nobody knows how to truly answer it. And, you know, I, and I like the idea of calling it work-life harmony, which is more and more of what like the business world does um, because they seem a couple of steps ahead of <laughs> the medical world in terms of this stuff, but it's about harmony, right? Like, some days you're going to be a better mom than you are a doctor and you're going to be a better researcher some days than you are a mom. And some days you're going to be a better wife, you know, if you've got date night um, or partner for that matter, um, than you are a clinician and, and it, it changes. And with that changing harmony, you hear, you know, it's different music every day, but ultimately it's all still music. You know, it really is. I, I know it sounds cheesy, but I don't know, maybe I was drinking some kind of Kool-Aid, cardio nerd Kool-Aid before I got on today. <laughs> I'm feeling optimistic. I think um, that's really important is not looking to balance because balance intrinsically, and I think Rob and I wrote about this um, fairly recently, it in intrinsically implies that there are two opposing forces. And so the minute you say balance, you actually feel really kind of torn apart, at least I do. Whereas harmony is all about integration right? Making it all work together. And so I really, I think you guys know this. I think words really, really matter. I think the way we receive information and think about things really is impacted by the words that we use. So I love harmony. And then getting to your specific question. Um, listen, I, I, I hope my husband never hears this podcast because his head will explode, but he really is the best. I mean, he's a true, true partner. He's a sponsor. He's supportive. And he's like my best friend. 
Um, I mean, listen, we both want to sort of wring each other's necks, like as every, you know, um, partnership that happens all the time sometimes, but um, I definitely would not be in this position without him, no question. Um, we take interest in each other's research. We take interest in, in like interesting clinical cases that we've seen that day. We take interest in each other's work politics and navigating those. And, you know, uh, he's currently at an ASGE meeting. Celia, you'll know what that is, right? And so I, I said, you know, can you put the kids down tonight? I have a cardio nerds recording. He's like, what do you mean? I have an eight to nine meeting at ASGE. And I'm like, oh, awesome. So you employ other help, right? That's what you do. You have other help and you make it work. You make it work. Um, and you, I think, really importantly respect each other's um, priorities, right? Like that's a priority for you. This is a priority for me. Not one is no less important or more important than the other. And um, if it is, then we sacrifice, right? So it's about gauging that and that's about constant communication. And it's about engaging other help, whether it's your in-laws or it's your parents or whether it's a nanny or whether it's your neighbors, whoever, it takes a village to get it done. Um, but. I mean, this may not sound like, you know, cardio nerds material, but I think whatever your relationship, um, it's important to take time out for each other, you know, carve out that time that is a date night um, for your partner, because it's the only time that you get to really communicate outside of all of this, you know, and you, you learn more and more about what's important to one another. And then you learn what to respect and what boundaries to cross and push. And sometimes what to kind of um, sort of uh, go along with. And so, you know, it's, it's a ride, um, but it's a fun one. That was all definitely Cardi Nerd's material, Dr. Lala. And it's so, um, you know, great for, for me to hear your, the way you navigate that because uh, my wife is a neonatology fellow and we have three young kids and some days the the harmony is uh, or the music is much more harmonious than others if you uh, if you know what i mean <laughs> and uh, you know today she's actually on call and um if it weren't for my the, the grandparents helping with the kids i don't know what you know this is you just you have to employ other help and it does take a village uh, it takes a large village sometimes um so it's great to hear about that aspect of your life and i want to turn gears to uh, another part of your life that I learned recently has been a really important uh, part of, uh, of of who you are today, and that spirituality has been an important part of your own journey and has been interwoven into your own clinical practice. And I'd, I'd like to kind of uh, hear a little bit about that uh, for our audience. I uh, enjoyed listening to a podcast where you discussed this, uh, the Road to Resilience podcast. Uh, but if you could share just a little bit about how spirituality has informed your practice, both in life uh, and with the patients, it'd be great. That's, thanks Amit, that's such a loaded uh, question. I'm so grateful to you for, for allowing me to, to share some of my thoughts in this space. I think um, it's an exciting time because I think more and more we're recognizing the importance of mindfulness and emotional and spiritual well-being being an essential part of carrying out our day-to-day -day lives with you know, integrity and, and sanity, quite frankly. <laughs> and, um, you know, spirituality means a lot of different things for a lot of different people. And I think that's what's nice, right? It's it, There's no right way uh, to be mindful. There's no right way to center yourself. Um, there's your way. And that's the beauty of it, right? It's like you're figuring out your own religion. My, my husband's Catholic. I was brought up Hindu. And you know, when we when we first met at that time, it felt like, oh, my God, this is going to be an issue. And now we've been married close to 14 years. And I can't even truly remember why it was the case, because we create our own religion. Right. And I think a lot of that has to do with us being at peace with ourselves as individuals. And then we're able to come together and, you know, hopefully be at peace with each other as well. Don't worry, there's, there are many days in our house where the music is not so beautiful either. Um, but in terms of spirituality, I mean, I, I it comes in many different forms, as I said. It can be as simple, I think, as um, just kind of centering yourself and, and 
asking yourself the question, like, what brings me joy? What fills my bucket, so to speak, right? What nurtures me? And then trying to figure out if you can do more of that so that you can be more effective at everything else that you do. Um, and so whether that ranges from working out to writing your journal, to reading sort of inspirational text, I sort of love people like Eckhart Tolle and Tara Brock and, um, I listen to podcasts all the time. I happen to love Super Soul Sunday, um, where you get to hear from different authors. You know, it's not just Oprah talking about her favorite things for the holidays. <laughs> it's really like deep, meaningful conversations. I was actually just re-listening to Tuesdays with Maury today on my way home. And I was thinking how relevant and apropos it was that I was gonna be speaking with you guys today. So I think it's interesting because there are two, sort of fundamental aspects of why we do everything we do in life, right? It's pursuit of happiness and sort of avoidance of suffering, right? Those are like, that's sort of the essence of everything, right? It's like, I don't want to feel pain and I want to feel joy, right? And then everything kind of stems from those two things. But what we realize is that as oftentimes what we think will bring us joy can be more fleeting than we originally anticipated. And so I think our job as human beings um, in our many different roles is to try and figure out what brings about lasting joy. And I think that comes from spending time with ourselves. I think I'm really struck by how many answers um, lie within us to the questions that we have. And uh, I'm kind of enjoying that process as I'm growing older, spending time uh, on my own, whenever that happens, it's generally like one in the morning at this point, <laughs> but, but um, seeking what, what will bring that lasting kind of tranquility um, is, is something that uh, excites me. And so uh, I, it's very much a, a process and there's never an end to that process because times are always changing. Circumstances are always changing and your needs change as you evolve. Um, but it's fun to see so much attention being paid to this space and, uh, you know, to bring it into your clinical practice and to your interactions with others, like, like we're doing now. Um, and, and in terms of clinical interactions, just recognizing we're all the same on the inside. We all desire the same ultimate things, which is joy and peace and um, fulfillment. And so I think when we see the oneness um, across uh, all kinds of people that we interact with, we ultimately uh, have many more pleasant interactions and um, there's a lot more benevolence that comes about, a less comparison, less envy, um, and more kind of encouragement and um, joy. So, and I think you guys are the perfect example of that. This is what you've created, you know? Uh, this is just a nice example of a, a platform that can bring joy across institutions and, and there's not, you know, a power struggle. So congratulations. That's just amazing, Dr. Lala. And thank you so much for such a wonderful answer. Um, you know, I, I'm just struck by how uh, you as, uh, you know, your, your spiritual self and you as a healer have almost made, you know, those two parts better, you know, like they, they, they inform one another. And in, in that other podcast and for the audience, I'm going to include a link uh, to the Road to Resilience podcast Dr. Lala was on because I just, I listened to it and I was just so deeply touched on so many different levels. And you mentioned uh, the teachings of Swami Vivekananda and I'll share just a brief story. So when I was in college, I, um, that's when I learned about Swami Vivekananda. And it was because uh, there was this girl who was raised very spiritual and I wanted to impress her. So I said, I'm going to read about Swami Vivekananda to impress her. And I realized that's very on brand because it's like the nerdiest way to get a date. I fully realized that. But that girl is now the mother of my three boys. So it worked out. <laughs> but... Um, I, you know, I, I started off reading his teachings just to have conversations with her, but I just got so deeply engrossed in his teachings for the sake of his teachings and his philosophies. And, um, you know, but, you know, from year to year, we get so caught up in the hustle and bustle of training and uh, becoming a doctor, the MCAT, the USMLE, this exam, that rotation, et cetera. You, you know, I, you kind of, 
it, it's very easy to allow yourself to lose that part of yourself. Um, to and, and it's kind of sad because we probably get exposed in our field and in our care of patients to some of the most deep and profound happenings of life, you know, and, and it's, we almost like don't have the time and space to explore that. So um, again, when I, when I listened to your podcast, it was just so refreshing to see how you've allowed yourself as a physician to dig even deeper. Um, so uh, thank you for that answer. Thanks, Amit. I love, love, love that story. It actually makes me feel sort of emotional. Um, <laughs> it really, that's, that's very beautiful. Um, I think there's so much power in vulnerability, you know, and I think the more we acknowledge that, the stronger and better we'll be for it. Thank you, Dr. Alala and Ahmed for sharing these. Like, this is really nice to hear. And speaking of philosophies that, philosophies that make us better doctors and wives and husbands and, and women, I find that human at times is a great medicine. We loved hearing that you dabbled in stand-up comedy in college, something that you share with Dr. Milton Packer. <laughs> Does humor or your experience as a comic affect how you practice today? And even better, would you care to show off one of your routines with us? Oh my God. Here we go from like total spirituality and Swami Vivekananda's <laughs> teaching to like, hey, you need a stand-up routine. So I, I mean, uh, gosh, I, I have to say embarrassingly so a lot of the whatever comic relief I had um, would be doing like short sort of stints in college. Um, and a lot of it stemmed from kind of really just uh, talking about how I was raised and sort of these outlandish stories of growing up. A lot of them were based in like South Asian and Indian humor, much like I thought Dan's last name was Ambinder and not Aminder. <laughs> it's a perfect <laughs> example of that, as you guys know. Um, so, so nothing that I have that I can share on the, on the spot, but uh, certainly humor brings a totally different dimension to how you interact with patients. I mean, listen, these, our patients speak about resilience. My goodness. You know, I think um, heart failure is, is one of the spaces where you really, really, really get to see resilience of the human spirit on a day-to-day -day basis. And if you don't bring a little bit of humor in, it can be pretty bleak at times. And so wherever you get that source, wherever, whatever makes you laugh, stick with it, you know? Uh, and so I, uh, I just encourage it no matter what. Um, and, and don't worry, I, I won't do any Indian impressions on this, on this podcast. Well, uh, thank you, Dr. Lala. And, you know, we've, we've talked about so many different topics here, but really the theme was about improving the health of our field and, and allowing all of us together to take better care of our patients. Um, you know, and one project that we're working on together uh, is, uh, and, and with Dr. Menz, is, you know, the creation of what we call the Cardiac Clinical Trials Network. And the inspiration behind that, well, the inspiration, if I back up, behind all of Cardiac has been how to pair educational content development with personal and professional development for trainees. And, you know, when we got on the topic of clinical trials, the, the issue there is not education. The issue there is trial enrollments. We said, okay, well, why don't we just shift gears and say, how do we pair equitable trial enrollment with fellow and trainee development? And, you know, everywhere we have a site PI for various trials asking fellows and residents, hey, do, if you find a patient that might fit my trial, let us know. But, but the trainee really just doesn't even make it onto the margins of those studies. So we said, okay, we'll create what we call the clinical trials network. And every site that has a residency program or a fellowship will work with the site PI to identify a, a fellow or resident really with an emphasis on making that group as inclusive and welcoming as possible and reward people and recognize people for helping us understand why trial enrollment historically has had challenges enrolling women patients, enrolling minority patients, and what's the deal there? We've had conversations on, as part of this series with Dr. Yancey, for instance, about why it's been challenging to enroll minority patients. Um, and, you know, so that's really hopefully the vision for that project. And I'm so glad to, uh, you know, that we're going to be working with you, Dr. Lala, and Mount Sinai as part of our pilot program for Paraglide HF. Um, you know, and actually when we were kind of conceiving the idea, Celia was one of the very first people we reached out to to just brainstorm because, um, you know, throughout 
the 160 plus podcasts, we've done literature searches and reviews to try to figure out what are the good questions to ask and meaningful questions to ask. And on a number of occasions, Silly, I came across one of your papers. You've just been so absolutely prolific and incredibly, like just wildly uh, successful in research and science. And I just want to turn uh, turn to you for a little bit and just ask you, what has your experience been as a young woman in cardiology embarking on um, you know, in the field of heart failure, this is your last year in training. You're going to be an attending next year. So what are you looking forward to and what are you taking away from this discussion? Thank you so much. Um, that was really very, very kind. And, um, you know, I really have been inspired by the cardio nerds platform and what you guys have been doing. And, you know, I think for me, I feel very grateful. Um, that's first and foremost, uh, grateful to really have just had incredible mentors and support and to have support of um, my parents and my fiance and, and friends. Um, and so I think in hearing everyone talk about their conversation, talking about harmony in life and, and just, um, you know, thinking about those things, um, that gives me a lot of satisfaction and comfort. Um, I would say that I think for me, um, one of the things that I perhaps underestimated and now I think place a lot more value in is really how social media has brought me together with so many people. And I think if we think back to the conversation that we were had about the pandemic, um, I just think, you know, there are so many incredible women who are doing things in heart failure and cardiology and men, of course, but I think um, there have just been so many newer venues, even despite not having, not going to meetings in person, but just forming new relationships with people. Um, and I think it's made me feel connected and supported in a way that I hadn't felt to this extent before. Um, and I think that that has been really powerful for me. Um, you know, I think that you learn a lot when you partner with people outside your institution. And I think that's one of the great things about cardio nerds too, bringing people together both within their institution and outside of their institution. And I think for me, you know, seeing how other people do things um, and trying to bring together shared resources, shared expertise, um, and I think that's partly why I have been able to be productive. Um, and I'm really grateful to have kind of my web of a network that really spreads to, you know, mentors like Dr. Michelle Kittleson at Cedar sinai um, and Dr. Jane Farr, who was at Columbia, but is now at UT Southwestern. Um, and Dr. Giverts, Michael Giverts, who is at Brigham, who I've worked with since I was a resident. Um, and others. And I think that that um, I'm just really grateful for that. I feel like I've started ranting. But um, so, yeah, I think that's, you know, that's where I am right now. And I think that um, I'm hoping that in the coming years, I can try and be a mentor to those people who are in cardiology fellowship, who are in internal medicine fellowship. Um, internal medicine residency, I should say, um, and, you know, help navigate that process, um, just be a supportive face. And I think it's also just an exciting time to be in heart failure, which is also really cool. And one of the things that I think I'm most excited about to be in attending, I was actually thinking about this and, you know, this might be an unusual answer, but so many times in training, I've had to say goodbye to my patients. And, you know, I think, you know, you have your patients that you have a relationship with in your residency clinic, and then you have your fellowship clinic. And I was able to take some of my patients from my general fellowship clinic to my advanced heart failure clinic. But it will be nice as an attending to not have to introduce myself, and then have a patient ask me, so how many years are you going to be here for? Because, you know, a lot of the patients are used to having this turnover. Um, and it's going to be really nice to just be able to be there and be their doctor 
um, for however long that will be without there being a clear time point on when that relationship ends. And, you know, there are going to be a variety of things and the relationship may end for a variety of reasons anyway, um, because people were always moving around. But I think that is something that I'm really excited about is to just have patients that really are mine. And I know that there's definitely ownership and training, but I think it's different. And I think that that um, is what I'm really excited about the most, because I think that's really why I chose heart failure too, is to see people through the ups and the downs, through the transplant evaluation, through the LVAD, through, you know, goals of care discussions, whatever it is. Um, and so I think finding, re honing my style and, you know, having those patients that are going to really, really have me as their doctor, I think is the most exciting. Well, thank you so much for that, Celia. That is incredibly profound. And we are excited for your patients um, as you move forward in that attending role. And that longitudinal relationship uh, is just going to be really, really um, uh, powerful for them and for you. And and we want you to keep us posted on how that goes. And thanks so much for your kind words about the Cardio Nerds platform. We completely agree that using social media and other avenues has connected us with all kinds of people across all kinds of institutions and allowed us to really witness this um, tremendous growth in, you know, in science and in education. And so we definitely uh, could relate to you on that point as well. And trust me, I guarantee you, uh, check your inbox. You'll be getting tons of emails from Amit putting you in touch with amazing people for you to mentor and sponsor. So um, <laughs> as long as you're, uh, uh, you're up for it, we're going to help Let find- uh, Leticia was the very first one. You remember that when yes. they moved to Columbia? So, yeah, so I was, I was about to jump in and say something really quick. So Celia mentioned that she wants to become a mentor to people and the importance of cardio nerds and of like having this network. And I have to say thank you to her and to the team as well, because when I moved to New York from another country to start residency, uh, Emmett put me in contact with her and just like to talk to her uh, to ask some silly questions, but that she was more than willing to answer and to help was really, really important uh, to me. And like, especially at the start of residency that I was freaking out. So I have to say thank you uh, to everyone, but especially to Celia, that was really important to me. Thank you. Letitia, that, this completely dovetails with what I was going to say next, you know, speaking about women leaders in academic cardiology, Amit and I are just so appreciative to have to have had a virtual front row seat to your major, major academic growth this year. And, you know, we got to see you in through the lens of the Cardio Nerds Academy intern, and that's coming to an end and really brings us goosebumps. And I'm not I'm not going to tear up here, but um, but we can't help but reflect on this. Letitia, you've done such a superlative job, not only with amazing production skills in terms of working with us on episodes that really highlighted key cardiovascular topics, including sarcoidosis, pregnancy and hypertension, patient perspectives of women heart champions, narratives and cardiology episodes, challenging cases of an autistic patient requiring heart transplant and several key adult congenital heart episodes. But you truly elevated your entire house. The house of Thomas really benefited from having you part of the team. So Letitia, we cannot thank you enough for taking a chance with the Cardio Nerds family and team. And um, uh, thank you so much, everyone, for being here tonight. This is just really inspirational. Celia, you continue to make the Cardio Nerds platform shine. Every episode you touch turns the pure audio and now visual gold, excluding myself, obviously. Um, the questions that you brought out here for Dr. Lala, um, really, really, really brought out some key important topics that needed to be addressed. And of course, Dr. Lala, it was amazing meeting you again for this time, the narrative series. And it was just so exciting to meet your little monkeys, your little adorable monkeys, I should say. So thank you so much for taking the time to address us and our amazing family. Thank you all so much. Thank you, Leticia. Thank you, Celia. Um, very excited to see you grow and Dan and Amit as always it's such a pleasure I'm so so proud of you and so grateful um, for this platform uh, keep going keep shining and uh, can't wait to see what the future holds <laughs>